The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Christy Thomas, and I do serve as the board chair for SACPA. And I want to welcome you today to our first session of the season. This is our 57th year of SACPA. And uh, SACPA is a, a volunteer local non for profit organization with our board members working to bring you weekly presentations from local to regional and to national current issue. So uh, a few housekeeping out of respect for the speaker. We please ask that you mute or turn off your cell phones. Um, our land acknowledgement was shown on the screen prior to our program to remind us each of our commitment to change. So our session will be begin 12 noon. Um, uh, the speaker will speak for about 25, 30 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A, and will end uh, at 1 o'clock. So I'd like to introduce to you today Dr. Dina McMartin. Dr. McMartin is the Vice President of Research at the University of Lethbridge. She is a leading researcher focused on rural, agricultural, and industrial water resources, management and treatment, as well as the impact of freshwater climate extremes on communities and economics. So Dr. McMartin joined the U of L in 2021 and had been previously served um, in faculty roles at both the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Regina. Today, though, she'll be speaking about what is the status of the federal, provincial, and private research funding at U Lethbridge. So please welcome me, or uh, help me in welcoming Dr. Mc 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 Dina McMartin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christy, and thank you everyone for the invitation to be here today. I know there's been a lot of conversation about research funding in uh, social media, in political circles, and uh, certainly it's always a big topic of conversation at the university um, because there's just never enough funding. You can't hear. Okay, so the people in the back. How close? Okay, am I close enough now? You've got me now? Okay. That's, that's a good tip. Thank you for waving and letting me know. Um, I know there are people in the room who have been at both the college, now the Polytech, and the university, who also have a lot of experience and knowledge about this. So I look forward to uh, being corrected by you as we go through this. Um, so why is it important for us to do research at a university? There are four universities in Alberta that are classified as research universities or comprehensive academic research universities. And the University of Lethbridge is one of those. So it's the University of Alberta, University of Calgary, Athabasca, and us. We're obviously a distant third to the big universities in the big cities, but Athabasca is a distant fourth from where we are. So we're very, diverse in our sizes and the kinds of activities we participate in. But research is really important because it helps to drive societal norms, information, knowledge, innovation, development. Um, it affects the way we think about the world around us. If we think about when we were first dealing with the news that we had a pandemic on our hands. Research helped us, first of all, identify that mRNA technology had been in research for about the previous 40 years, but hadn't really found a purpose yet. And all of a sudden, that fundamental research that had been conducted in a lab for 40 years became really, really relevant. We also learned very quickly about people's behaviors and changes in behaviors and what stresses and big changes in expectations and restrictions would do to people's behaviors. And so looking at social sciences, the, the psychology of how people behave became really important as well. Um, why it's important for the university? It's important for us to actually recruit students, to bring in great faculty and keep them. Um, and also to give our students an opportunity to really follow their passions, to identify something they're super excited about and have a chance to contribute to that might actually have an impact at the global scale. In terms of rankings, it's also really important for our reputation. So when people around the world are looking at the University of Lethbridge, 
the research we do impacts what they see and what we are known for around the world. So when students from Calgary or parents from Saskatoon or families in Halifax are looking for where they want their kids to go to school, they look at the research activity and because that's also an indicator of how current and knowledgeable our faculty are. So the quality of education is impacted by the activity that our faculty members are doing. The, but research is expensive. There are some who would say research is not worth the investment. Right? It's expensive, it's costly to the university, it's costly to society. It's a public good, though. And so we spend a lot of money at the university and a lot of time investing in research, whether that's research about technology in the classroom, in K-12 schools, or the importance of people having access to English literature in multiple languages or in different formats so that it's accessible for those who are perhaps losing their sight or losing, um, you know, their dexterity. We're looking at technologies around helping to improve water use in the agricultural areas, right? So all these different ways that we invest in research, but they are expensive. There's salaries, of course, of all the people who are conducting the research. Um, we spend a lot of money on student recruitment and to support students by giving them scholarships and salaries as well. And then it's expensive for us to share our knowledge. So to go to a conference or to publish a paper costs a lot of money right now. Um, we're, we're in a bit of an interesting phase in research dissemination or research publishing where the only way I can make my research readily available to everyone is for me to pay for it. So I do all the research, the university pays my salary, a granting agency gives me money to do that, and then I have to take some of that money and give it to a publisher to make sure that anybody can see it rather than only those with a subscription. So it's an expensive um, series of events that take place. So if we think about a sound studio, just as an example on our campus, there are both indirect costs and direct costs. So indirect costs are things like keeping the lights on, keeping the AV system running, maybe updating it every once in a while and figuring out how it works, um, building that special room, that space, hiring the faculty who are going to do work in that space. So that's all indirect costs. We're, we're spending those, that money for sort of a, a long-term investment, the things that we need to have. The direct costs then are the people who are operating that space on a regular basis. So the technical staff who are in there specifically and only to operate that. The equipment, a new microphone, um, different sound boards, different equipment, the, you know, replacing the, the walls if there's a special need. And then of course the student performers, the readers, the researchers who are making use of that space are all direct costs because we're paying them directly, regardless of whether or not, so we pay for the room, regardless of whether or not there are people using it, so that's indirect, and then the people using it are the direct. And I know this is, like this is the boring mechanical part of my talk, I'm really sorry about that, but it all matters in terms of how money flows to the university and why political decisions matter. So our provincial research funding then comes to us from different department and ministry contracts, agreements, we get grants from Alberta Innovates as well, which of course is a crown corporation, and other provincial entities. So there are a variety of different ministries, departments, individuals who we work with, who want to work with us, have a little bit of funding, maybe can't do all the research on their own, or are looking to help a student learn how to do that work, maybe give them a test drive, see if there's somebody they want to hire long term. And so they will give us both direct and indirect money to help fund that program or fund that research. Um, so the province provides funding sort of in those ways. They don't necessarily have any funding agencies, but they have different departments and ministries and crown corporations. There's also a special pool of funding that matches federal investment in infrastructure. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. But so the Canada Foundation for Innovation, or CFI, is 
helps us to buy really high-tech equipment, to renovate high-tech research facilities, where we do innovative work that in is intended to then, again, impact society and improve different technological advancements. The province, though, restricts the way that they put money into research, right? It's their money, well, it's our money, but it's, you know, it's, their, it's the government prerogative to set priorities. And so right now, the four to six different provincial priorities, and they change every few years, but they try not to change them too often because it's almost impossible for us to shift too quickly. Um, but our researchers at the university apply for these funds. They're competitive. There's a set formula, formula a template for them to fill in. But they have to apply to areas that are aligned with you know, artificial intelligence, the way that artificial intelligence is being used in, you know, in, our, in our technology, but also in, in the way that information is shared, whether that's on social media or elsewhere. Clean resource technologies, which is actually more around, so it's, it's green technology, so it's green power and, and those kinds of things, but it's also, that's where the funding, for instance, for carbon capture and storage would sit in terms of a provincial priority. Digital health, so how are we doing a good job? And the thing is, so AHS has been the envy of the rest of the Canadian system for health data management. And you having a really strong digital system for patient information to be accessible wherever you are in the province. Um, the way that that information is used, how that looks into the future, is um, is still you know a little bit unknown at this moment, but the work around digital health to determine is there a different way you know if you can't access a doctor is there a strong way of accessing health online but still have access to experts and expertise. Um, critical min minerals you've probably heard some news about you know there's a lot of work going on right now around lithium extraction in the province so those are the kinds of things that are that are being looked at um, blue and green hydrogen development um, some of the the you know a lot of the high-tech development in in electronics really requires special minerals and we have some of those in Alberta but they haven't been exploited in the past and so there's a lot of work on that and then of course smart agriculture so looking toward, and again, this is another digital theme, so looking at how we improve the sensors, the digital information, the use of that information, and then how does AI help uh, producers make better decisions that are either better for environment or economy or both. So one example of some funding we received over the summer or earlier this spring, um, so Campus Alberta, which again is those four universities kind of sharing resources back and forth, um, have access every three or four years to a pot of money from Alberta Parks, or Alberta Environment and Protected Areas. And so this year we received eight grants, totaling $500,000 to support different research. Most of that research is in the sciences, one of them is in social sciences. So one of them is looking at the impact of um, forest fires, wildfire displacement on people and, and how they recover from that kind of trauma experience. The others are focused on, you know, what are we doing to improve water storage in the area? How can we store more carbon in water systems? Um, looking at insect, insects and pollinators, which of course is really important, and then some endangered fish and bird species in the area as well. So there are other areas where the provincial government does invest that don't necessarily align exactly with those four to six provincial priorities. And that's usually where the U of L does best. To be honest, we do best in the specialized calls because we don't do a lot of work in critical minerals or clean energy technologies. So there's also an opportunity to get funding from the provincial government, mostly through personal relationships. So you meet somebody at a conference, or you're chatting at a SACPA event and realize, hey, we've got some things in common. We should work together. So a contract is created, some money is sent to the university. Because we have that unique experience or expertise, we may have the, the facility or the equipment that is required that our partner doesn't have. And so we agree to partner on that research. And 
overhead, which is that indirect cost, is often paid then by the government as well. So they give us an extra 20% to cover those costs of the faculty salary, keeping the lights on, keeping the water running, um, those kinds of activities. Um, we generally at the University of Lethbridge put that money back into internal grants because not every faculty member can apply for this kind of funny funding and be successful. Sometimes they need a little boost. So we usually take that 20% and actually put it back into new research activities that maybe won't be funded by the province. Federal research funding is a lot more complicated. So you may have heard of the tri-councils, sometimes called the tri-agencies, um, but they offer you know, sort of your basic grant, and they're called grants in kind. So they're not meant to fund the entire research project. You're supposed to, as a faculty member, go out and scrounge to find a little bit more to make up the difference. But they'll give you part of the money you need to work on a program over about three to five years. Um, most of the time, those are really well defined. So, you know, so I apply for funding in the um, civil and environmental engineering program. Every five years, I apply for, for a grant. And it's a group of peers from across the country who review my grant and decide whether or not I am worthy of funding. So there's no, there's no political interference in those, in those grants. There's no sort of special calls or special topics or specific priorities that are being set by any governments. That's peers supporting peers. The special topics grants often are focused on some of the issues and priorities of the federal government of the day. So a few years ago, there was a special call asking for proposals on energy transition planning. Right, so how are provinces, how is the federal, um, how, is the, how is the country going to shift from a primarily fossil fuel based energy production environment to one that is more mixed or more diversified and eventually toward one that is less re um, reliant on fossil fuels. Um, there are some that focus on indigenous education opportunities, for instance. So how are we going to improve access and success rates for indigenous populations in K-12 education, and how will that translate into improved university access, college access, and better jobs, better economics for families, and hopefully better social determinants of health as well. So there are lots of different programs like that. There's one recently announced on the international collaboration side with Europe. So the federal government signed an agreement with the European Union. And uh, so for the first time, Canadian um, faculty members are eligible to hold grants in collaboration with European partners, whether that's other faculty members or different governments, industries, um, you know, volunteer organizations, not-for-profits. And those are very, very lucrative grants. The EU invests in research in a way that Canada doesn't quite understand. Um, so the, the average grant size on those are around $6 million Canadian. So, you know, it's quite a nice chunk of change. You don't really see a lot of those announcements on the Canadian scale. And then I already mentioned CFI, so that's the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Those are our infrastructure grants. So they're decided at the federal level, but then the provinces have to match. So it's a real tightrope for faculty to walk to make sure that they're hitting both federal and provincial priorities to get the money from both governments. Um, and then of course, all those same department and ministry contracts and agreements. So I'll go through these a little, little bit more. Um, the tri-councils, who are they? So there, there are three, as in try. Um, so Canadian Institutes for Health Research, so any research that's done that's medical or clinical, pharmaceutical trials, new um, medical devices, those kinds of research are all funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, very much as it says, so pretty much all of the sciences and engineering focus. Um, so anything to do with building water treatment plants or determining, again, the sage grouse, you know, impacts in, in this region, um, wetland development, all those kinds of things are funded by natural sciences and engineering. And then the social sciences and humanities research, that's our education research, business research, the fine arts, um, philosophy, English, 
Um, mostly those. There are, there are many others as well, of course, um, sociology. So oftentimes those are the ones where we see the most conflict or controversy on a political scale because they're addressing human behavior and sometimes exposing things that we don't want to know about ourselves or don't want others to see. And so they can be kind of controversial. They're focusing on everything from how do people who are in a, you know, in a transition phase, if they're transgender, dealing with the environment around them? Or how is that changing their family relationships? Right, so those are the kinds of, you know, sometimes hot topics that are happening in, in that field. So how, um, so how the funds flow, basically as a faculty member, I apply for a grant. If I get the, if I submit my proposal, um, my peers, so people who have been successful getting these grants in the past, sit around a table and they debate. They debate the merit of my proposal, my idea. They debate the merit of me, right? Because the person also matters. And they debate the merit of my experience in supporting graduate students and undergraduate students to learn and get gainful employment. So it's highly competitive. Depending on which grant you're applying for, it's anywhere from 10% success rate to about 65%. So there are a lot of people who work for many, many years trying to get one of these grants, and it's a real struggle because it is competitive. And every year, there are thousands of Canadian researchers who don't get funding. The interesting distinction here is the awards are made to the faculty member, not to the university. So like I said, I have an NSERC grant, Natural Sciences and Engineering. I don't have to hold it at the University of Lethbridge. As a faculty member, I can hold it anywhere that another university is willing to help me. So it was mentioned in my bio, I came from the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Regina. I can choose to hold my NSERC grant at either of those universities rather than holding it at the University of Lethbridge because the grant is to me, not to the university. That's an important distinction when we talk about political impacts on um, Bill 18 in particular. So part of why it's also really important to me at the University of Lethbridge is because for every grant we hold, we get extra money from the federal government for me to pay my staff, for us to buy library resources, to pay for research finance staff, to pay for the animal ethics team, to, uh, what else do we do? We do a lot of things with that money. To pay for patents and commercialization activities, to run some of our research facilities in, in West Castle and elsewhere. So that funding that comes, but it's a proportion of what we hold at the university. So when a faculty member chooses to not hold their money at the university, that money goes to a different university. So I get all the costs and that other university gets all the money. So that's, that's dangerous. So here's just a little quick overview of what that looks like. So I'm a researcher with a question. And I think, you know, I'm gonna talk to somebody sitting at their desk. They're gonna have a look at what I'm, what I'm talking about. Give me some feedback. Yeah, they probably like it a little bit. Ch make some changes to it. It gets submitted then to comments. So one or two people will look at my grant first before it goes to the big committee. And they're going to make some comments that will help the overall committee decide whether or not I should get my money. Then the big committee looks at it. They say, yeah, we agree with what those early reviewers said, or no, we don't. Or, you know, we really like the idea, but maybe it's not defined as well as it should be, so we'll give them partial funding. If we get that grant, the little green box, there's money that goes straight to the researcher, like I said, so that the grant itself goes to the researcher, but then I also get that indirect cost financing. So I get the money to pay for my staff. Every success we get also impacts the number of Canada research chairs we get on campus. So the federal government invests three ways for one grant, right? So the grant to goes to the researcher, the grant that comes to the university, and the contribution that is made to how many Canada research chairs we get. And the number of Canada research chairs, so those are basically fully paid faculty members 
who spend most of their time on research. They also really help with our reputation. CFI funding is different. So that infrastructure and equipment funding is all owned by the university. So it requires the provincial matching though, so it means a lot of political maneuvering before we even apply. There's no point in applying to the federal program if the province isn't interested in providing their part. And they are institutional, so it's, it's a university award, not an individual award. They also provide what they call an infrastructure operating fund, which is that indirect cost again. So they give us 30% of the federal award, and we get to use that then to actually help operate that equipment, that facility, um, maybe even pay for some staff to help work in that facility. So again, there's three different, uh, three different ways that money flows. Well, it's really two ways. A group of people apply for the money, it's thought about, a committee de deliberates on it, they decide whether it's a yes or no, and then all of that money comes to the university. So the grant comes to the university and the overhead comes to the university. Because then it's my job to make sure we manage the project and either build a new room or create a new facility or buy the right equipment. Other federal research funding is much like I said, you know, when you have got those personal relationships with a, fun with a department or a ministry, or sometimes they have a special call for funding like with the Alberta Environment Grants. So, you know, so I hold one of these as well. Before I came to academia, I worked at Environment Canada for a bit. My former supervisor there still sends me contracts every once in a while. So we continue to do long-standing pro projects we've been working on for the last 25 years. Those are based on the oil, oil sands uh, tailings ponds. So 25 years, still no answer. Um, which is great as a researcher, not so great as a citizen. So it's usually people reaching out because you've got unique expertise and experience, and usually federal government departments will not pay more than 20% of overhead. It's important to note maybe at this point that the actual overhead is between 60 and 80%. So that's how much the university is picking up. Every time we get a grant, it's great and it's really important, but our actual costs are much higher than anybody's actually paying for. So in this case, again, the researcher asks a question, talks to their buddy, buddy says, hey, I like that idea, provides some funding to the researcher and to the university. So you can see that the research money affects our budget. It changes the way, the money we have internally to pay for students, to pay for faculty, to pay for library. Um, it also affects how the province sends us money because we have an institutional management agreement that requires that we hold industry funded research. If I don't meet that target, we lose operating budget. The research support fund comes from the federal government and that's based on a percentage of the tri-council funding we get. That runs my entire department and some of the library and some of finance. The overheads, like I said, general funding to support operations and other internal programs. So when people are struggling to get external funding, I take that money and I put it back into the people on our campus. And then sometimes we put that, um, there's, there's money that goes into the faculty research expenses as well. So there's a lot of different ways that our budget is impacted by how we're successful we are with research. All together, now this is old data, and I realize that light blue color was a really bad choice. I'm so sorry. Um, but what you can see, hopefully, from this is so our tri council funding um, sits around between eight and ten million dollars a year. Um, all of our other external for sources are around between ten and twelve. So we bring in about twenty five million dollars a year in research funding at the University of Lethbridge. My research support fund is now actually over 2.5 million, so that's what I have to run, run all of the research operations on campus. And we bring in about another million in other research operations or overheads, and again, that's the money I put back into research on campus. So I already mentioned, Research is really in part about reputation, but it's also about societal benefit. It's about informing and improving society, making lives easier for people, making lives better. It helps us bring in graduate students, undergraduate students, and frankly, I mean, the University of Lethbridge, one of the things we do best is our undergrad research programming. 
absolutely stellar, one of the best in the country, if not the best. If we didn't have research, those opportunities wouldn't exist. We wouldn't have as many students coming here, spending their time and their money here, and uh, hopefully making Lethbridge their home. So thank you. I'm open to questions, and as I say, maybe some answers. Big thank you to LSEO for providing this room free of charge. Thank you, everyone, for patronizing their lunch counter. A big thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thank you to the Lethbridge Herald and other media coverage, as well as thank you to Rogers TV for recording our sessions available on TV and at sacpod.ca. Next week, we have another researcher, Dr. Tim McAllister, my direct supervisor. He'll be speaking to us uh, from the Lethbridge Research Center about cows and methane. So we ask those who are willing to ask questions to line up along the wall here. Please state your name and your question briefly. Uh, no long preludes or stories. We expect polite and re respectful discourse. Uh, if you prefer to write your question down, just let me know and you can pass it to me. So. Do we have any questions? Is it too, <laughs> too many mechanics, not enough stories. No, no. <laughs> They'll come out in the questions. <laughs> it's a race. <laughs> okay. Get real close to the mic. Yeah, it is very. Okay, just a moment. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, just as a, for full disclosure. I am just graduating from the University of Lethbridge after 52 years this fall. No, 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 no. <laughs> Completely inadvertently, I have to tell you. But in coming back, I mean, my relationship to the university has much changed. And the question I really have isn't so much, is the emphasis on research on the sciences in the University of Lethbridge at the moment. And I, I'm going to extrapolate this to most of the uh, universities in Canada, if not North America. The liberal arts are being scanted. Uh, if you go out to the university here, you look at the, the, just even the faculty numbers in things like English or history or anthropology, they're not at where they should be. So what you're winding up with is a situation where you're getting undergraduate students coming in and yes, they may develop research skills, but I really question whether or not they're gaining a fully rounded education. Do so you want to comment on that? Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are so many competing needs on campus, and it is it is important to recognize that. Um, yet we don't have anywhere near the faculty numbers or the staff numbers we did four or five years ago. Um, so there, there is that challenge, absolutely. But I will say we are so fully committed to the liberal education model. Um, it's really important for us to be ensuring that students have that opportunity to develop their critical thinking skills, to understand more than their disciplinary knowledge. And sometimes that is a bit of a battle and there's some tension on campus between different departments and faculties um, about what that looks like for their students. Um, but I will say, you know, so, I mean, I talked about being an NSERC researcher, but I also do social sciences research with colleagues, um, primarily in psychology and education, and looking at the importance of how people understand the environment around us, how we treat the environment around us. And so, I mean, I personally value and, and um, would never want to see a university that doesn't have strong humanities, strong social sciences. Um, but I know that that's sometimes not where we're seeing investments, and we're certainly not seeing a lot of support necessarily, whether it's you know from society in general or um, in our political sphere. So it's a good question, and it's something we're definitely worried about. Move my purse there too. Terry Shellington is my name. By the way, uh, I think we celebrate that this is our first session with our new sound system mm -hmm. that was installed over the summer and which SACPA contributed to. So, so we celebrate that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you don't have to be a political genius to figure out that there's a different set of priorities in Edmonton than in Ottawa. <coughs> and I'm curious how, how that impacts. Uh, 
your uh, you struggle to please different masters and and uh, get the money in the end. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great question. I mean, the wonderful thing about researchers is how creative they are, right? And so um, I always say to to colleagues and and even in my own research, you know, give me an idea and I'll find a way to make myself fit into it. Right there, there, there's always an opportunity. There's always that that oppor um, that chance to to align what we do without selling out, right? So I think about one of the projects we're um, we're working on at the university right now is one of those big Canada Foundation for Innovation grants to really extend out what we're doing in new media and digital technologies in the fine arts. Now the governments may not be interested in that. But when I tie it to the film industry, to talent development, to community benefit, suddenly everybody's interested, right? So I don't necessarily talk about the cool new microphone we're buying. I talk about the cool new graduates we're producing. So that's part of how we, how we get around or work within those structures. Those structures aren't necessarily new and those conflicts are not new either, right? This is just a point in time that many, Many universities, many uh, faculty members, many c citizens have, have had to deal with where there's this, you know, strong tension between different governments. And what I figure is there's always a path forward, right? So it's partly my job to find that path, <coughs> which is maybe an overly political answer to what you were actually asking me for, but um, there it is. <laughs> Uh, my name is Terry Whitehead. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned, I think, roughly $30 million a year coming into the institution and research dollars, which is uh, outstanding. It would be great to have more, obviously. But uh, can you comment on the economic impact of that $30 million in Lethbridge and maybe the surrounding community that, uh, you know, so we understand how that benefits more than just uh, on our campus? Sure. Thank you. Right, so I, I had mentioned that there's about $30 million coming to the university in various research funding. Some of that goes directly to students in terms of scholarships from the federal government or the provincial government. Um, and obviously those students are paying for rent, buying groceries, having a good time in the city, hopefully not causing too many problems. Um, but also really integrating into the city and I hope choosing to make their, make their careers and spend, spend their time here, grow their families in Lethbridge because we totally, we, we very much see the importance of that integration and the connection between the university and the community. So a lot of our research funding as well goes to activities around you know, the volunteer Lethbridge group and the kinds of activities that are being done for that. We spend a lot of our research funding and time working with local agricultural producers, small businesses, um, you know, different literary societies in the community trying to see, be seen as and contribute to being part of the community. And so it is essential for us to always be demonstrating how important the city is for us and how important we are for the city. Um, and I appreciate the question because you're right, sometimes it's very easy for those of us in the university to focus on the benefit to the university and not articulate clearly the fact that we exist in this universe, in this city, because the citizens essentially rioted for one, right? And so we take that history and that tradition very, very seriously. We know the university is important to this city and we need to be relevant, we need to be working with community members, and any time you have an idea or you know somebody who wants to connect to the university, you have my email address. We may not have the person who, who can do the work, but we might. I'd always love to talk to you about your ideas, where you see that we can do more and be better in our community. Uh, my name is Gordon McKaig, and I have a shirt on that says Guelph. That means I'm from the University of Guelph, so I'm a bit of a ringer. I, my, my job is actually writing CFI grants, or part of the job, writing grant applications. And I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about, uh, first of all, $30 million for a university the size of Lethbridge is astounding. It really is. The University of Guelph is quite a bit larger than the University of Lethbridge, and ours is $90 million a year. So that's something significant. So. What's the breakdown of, for the tri-councils, for your CI, 
CIHR, <clears throat> your answer can assure uh, grants, where, where is the most money coming into the university? Thanks for that. Always good to have a competitor in the room. Um, you know, we're, we're coming after your ag programming. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the majority of our research funding is in our natural sciences and engineering um, as well as really strong showing in health research. And so we are one of the very few universities that does not have a medical college that is a force to be reckoned with in health funding. So that's in large part our neurosciences programs, but it's also the psychology, kinesiology, and biochemistry work. So we have one of Canada's top RNA research facilities. We develop vaccines on campus. We do some really interesting stuff. That's all very expensive research. And so I guess to also put that into context, so the majority of the money is coming into the health sciences and the natural sciences and engineering, but that's also the most expensive research. So what I would say is we don't have as much money on the social sciences side, but proportionally, what I'm looking at is engagement. How many of our faculty are applying for those funds? And they're all about equal. We have a little bit of work to do still on the social sciences and humanities, but they are very, very close to equal. And so everyone is contributing and asking good questions and getting some funding to, to answer those questions. Another ringer. <laughs> well, full disclosure, uh, Dean is actually my boss. So, um, <clears throat> but I, I and, and I really appreciated all the answers she's given. It's, I've sort of had a few questions, and every one of them has kind of been answered before I got up here. Um, but I would like Dina, if you can, um, to talk about funding. Yep. Oh, sorry. My name is Leo. Leo Brooks, and I would like Dina to talk, if you can, about. Um, some of the funding opportunities that the university is seeing which are beyond funding agencies mm -hmm. and in particular um, partnerships with industry and, and community members and and how we're what we're doing to try to promote and 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 look to that as an alternative source of funding okay. well Leo asks a question that is actually his responsibility <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so Leo is our partnerships and commercialization officer, and uh, so he's the one who helps us with creating the partnerships, the relationships, the contracts, the agreements with outside partners, agencies that are not members of government. Right, so all of the contracts, when I was talking about you know, having a special contract with Environment Canada, that actually goes through Leo's office, not through other, other teams um, on campus, but so, really in partnership. So I think about, you know, there are a number of partnerships and relationships that we've been building with a lot of local egg producers, for instance, going out and having the conversations to say, um, you know, what kind of work do you need to be done? And so for about five years, we had a, a research chair funded by the Potato Growers Association because they had a number of questions really relevant to what's happening in the Southern Alberta landscape. We have a number of researchers who are also looking at, and I think this actually caused a bit of controversy when it hit the media, we're doing rice research at the university, and yes, we are in a semi-arid region and there's no water, we're doing dry land rice research. So how can we produce rice, which is such an important staple food around the world, without that amount of, that, that requirement for, for water? Um, so we work with a lot of different industry partners who are interested in working with this very entrepreneurial region of Canada, right? I have never seen more small businesses, more agricultural producers interested in taking a risk, trying something different, putting a few dollars into something and seeing how it works out. This area is rich with opportunities. And so for us, it's really about going out and talking to people, making those connections, and then if they don't necessarily have the money to invest in things, part of our job is to go out and see what other funding sources or partnership opportunities exist to help pay for that research. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for this great presentation. My name is Jason Schreiner. Um, dig in if you can. Uh, How is Bill 18 affecting your work? <laughs> <laughs> We knew it was going to come up. Um, 
So, so far, Bill 18 has had minimal impact on our work. Um, the biggest requirement over the summer was that we had to collect a lot of data for government to look at to see, for them to un better understand where we get funding and what we get funding for. And so we were required to submit um, a full analysis of all federal funds received by the university, not just for research, but also, you know, when we hold Pride Day events. We get a government grant to do that. And so we had to include an entire list, you know, summer jobs programs, um, all of the research funding that we, we receive. Unfortunately, at the U of L, we that's a manual process. So some of the staff who are here today were involved with a lot of heavy lifting and Excel spreadsheet searching and trying to find all that data, put it together. Um, what the government discovered is that in the province, there's about $300, $300 million coming from the federal government into our universities to support research. So again, that's, you know, that, that's a fair chunk of money. Um, what we have been advised, and I'm speaking a little bit out of school here because I've only been told verbally, there's nothing in writing yet, but we've been advised that the tri-council funding will be exempt from Bill 18. Oh, so Bill 18 is the, uh, so it's, I'm trying to remember exactly what it's called, but it's basically the Federal Funding to Public Entities Act. And so any, the Alberta Priorities Act, there you go. Um, it's essentially, so all of us who are classified legally as provincial entities, which the universities are, but so are municipalities, um, that we will be required to have prior approval to accepting federal research funding because the federal government actually doesn't have jurisdiction. So from a legal perspective, they're right. The federal government has no jurisdiction over the university. But hopefully my, my presentation showed you that we don't survive without federal funding. So it's a bit of a catch-22 for us to figure out how we make sure that we're demonstrating to the provincial government that that research funding is really important and it's not a threat. Right, it's actually, it's really important investment and it's a demonstration of value to our university. If we were to lose access to federal research funding, I think you would see a mass exodus of faculty members from this province. We wouldn't be able to recruit. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I'm one of the people who could hold my grant somewhere else. I don't have to bring it here. And I think that's what we would also see. Some people would stay, but none of the money would be coming here. It would be held at other universities in other provinces. And that is completely opposite to what the government is actually saying they want. So we're just having some really good conversations about what that means to build, to build some trust, but also to respect that each of the governments has a really important role to play in funding nationally important and internationally influential research. Hi, um, my name's Ken Haxtell. Uh, he took my question. Oh, yeah, you're not close enough to Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. It's too it's short. Comfortable with close. Okay. Yeah. My name's Ken Haxtell. Uh, he took my question. Uh, I just uh, <clears throat> just want to make a comment that if in, if in fact they do enact or they do uh, use part of Bill 18, I hope that the university cries loud and hard about, uh, about that kind of intrusion into, uh, into uh, the uh, grant funding. So thank you for your question. I'm just gonna, I'll quickly, I'll just quickly say, yeah, I mean, we see it as, so it's really, really important, obviously, for us to defend the um, faculty members in doing the research that they want to do. That's part of what academic freedom is all about, and it's absolutely essential to the operation of a healthy and vibrant university environment. And so, yes, we're having very long and difficult conversations, but I think there is a lot of understanding at this point that was not there earlier on in the conversation. And just through today's com you know, presentation, I think some of our folks in government actually didn't know how the research money flows. And so the more we all know about how the money comes to the university or to the faculty member or to others, the better we are to have really meaningful conversations about it. And so that's part of why I wanted to share this with you today is so you can see the impacts to the university, but also to the individuals on our campus. 
you might need it down. <laughs> I'll definitely need it down. Belinda Cruz, and thank you, Dina, so much for the presentation. Are there policies or protocols that the university has for funding you won't ex or accept, or certain organizations you wouldn't accept research funding from? And how do you manage that when you get somebody with a lot of money, but you don't want to work with them or can't work with them? Mm, good question. So some of that comes back to academic freedom. If a faculty member wants to work with someone who wants to give them money, then we just make sure that we protect their rights and protect the university's um, autonomy as best we can. We actually do have a policy, I've been going through it recently, that speaks to we will not impede a faculty member in accepting funding from any source. I'm looking at that policy uh, at the moment, but it's also really important, I think, to recognize that, so both the federal and provincial governments have restricted lists, right? So at this moment, we are not legally allowed to accept funding from any Russian entity, right? So for instance, there are a number of different entities and countries on those, on those lists, um, but from a university perspective, it's my job to help the faculty member be successful. How they define success is their job, not mine. Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you very much. Very uh, uh, kudos to you for your uh, 3.5 million. That's phenomenal for one researcher. <clears throat> uh, you spoke about one of the research areas that is about storing water in fire-prone areas. We've heard Kevin Van Tegen talk about restoring logging roads that have cut through the watersheds, our watersheds, uh, releasing the water, and uh, thus the water is not being stored there any longer. What research is the U of L, if any, doing on watershed um, res restoration? Thank you. Yeah. Good question. This one's now in. More, more right up my alley. Um, so a lot of the work we do is around improving wetland performance, so trying to restore wetlands and other, other areas. Um, I think we're all well aware that we need better water storage and more environmental water storage in this area, particularly as we see increasing drought periods, um, droughts and floods, which are always um, challenging to manage. Um, there isn't a lot of specific work right now going on in terms of restoration in the mountains, but we're working with a number of researchers who, you know, interestingly, one of our one of our master students defended her thesis on the fire likelihood of Jasper the day after Jasper was evacuated. And so, you know, the timeliness of some of this research, sometimes we're just a little bit late, um, but sometimes we're right on schedule. And so there are some researchers who are now really looking at, um, you know, we have great relationships in the Castle Provincial Park and in Waterton National Park. And so that's really where we're focusing most of our efforts around water management, fire management, uh, and then the people side of things. Because as I mentioned, all of those regions are really important to the people. And if I've learned anything about this area, the number one thing that doesn't matter what your political stripe is or what your background or beliefs are, water is the thing that matters to everybody. And so it's a really great sort of rallying point, I think, for our communities. Hi. Hi. Did that go through? Uh, I think so. You got to get really. <coughs> You have to eat it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Henning Wendell is my name. Um, long time retired, but f f former researcher at the Ag Research Center. And so my question relates to the uh, level of cooperation of researchers at the university with, for example, the Ag Canada Research Center, realizing it's a federal agency, so you couldn't be using federal grants, which come through grants for use there, but during my uh, almost 30 years there, I've for 29 years I've received provincial grants, for example, and industry grants, but I just wonder what's the level of cooperation there? Absolutely. 
That's a great question. We, we work very closely with the Ag Canada Research Station. Um, a lot of our students both have work terms there, but a lot of our master's and PhD students spend their entire time doing their research at, at those facilities, working with the researchers. Your speaker next week, Tim McAllister, um, his spouse is a, is a faculty member at the University of Lethbridge, so they do a lot of research together on cows and methane and all these great things with E. coli and, and other bacterial challenges. Um, so we have, over the last three years, we've actually hired a number of new agricultural researchers and professors on the University of Lethbridge campus. It's an area we're growing into. We're going to be expanding our programming, changing our programming, and really adding to the research because we recognize the importance not only for the region, but with the Ag Canada station being so close, um, there's, a, there's a tremendous opportunity for us to expand that relationship. Um, we also have, we have a tripartite MOU between the Polytech, the university, and the, and the Ag Canada station because we recognize the importance of the expertise and the specialist knowledge that each of those institutions brings to the table. None of us can solve the good problems without all those different skills um, coming together. Last question? Okay. All right, thank you. Carol Beswick. Um, I have questions on donors. <laughs> Are funds donated by individuals treated any differently than funds presented by government entities? Okay, like better, worse, otherwise? Yep. Okay, where do they go? Where do they go? Um, okay. So yeah, so um, research funding is research funding. We are source agnostic for the most part. So um, I think about, um, you know, so the, the potato growers, for instance, what they wanted to do was to fund a research chair to work on issues specific to Southern Alberta. That's what we hired, that's what that person does. Do they always agree on the focus? No. The faculty member has academic freedom to do different things, not only what they're funded to do. And the uh, potato growers have an opportunity to ask for more, right? And so we, we have lots of conversations about the way that research funding is used um, on campus, but it really doesn't matter the source. The same rules always apply. Okay, and right second to that is accountability. How are individual donors to specific projects um, informed about the progress of their research? So in any donation or um, funding agreement, we have very clear requirements for reporting back. So depending on how that contract or agreement is negotiated, it's either an annual report or it can be a more regular report. It can include having, a, having an open conversation about the, the outcomes or that the information be held embargoed for a short period of time. We don't hold anything secret or confidential beyond the period of which a student can publish their work. So it always comes back to the student. So long as we've protected the student, then the information can be publicly shared. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. This concludes our Q&A. Um, as a person who is a product of the university and did a graduate degree there, I stayed and chose to live and start my life here 20 years later. So um, I can. This, this presentation really hits home. So, so thank you for that. Um, before I let everyone go and, and, and Dr. M uh, McMartins have the last word, how does everyone like the new AV system? Can you see and hear OK? Awesome. Great. That's such a good feeling. So I'll just leave you with the last word. Yeah, I just um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming out. I know this is the uh, the first of the of the series this year, so hopefully everything is uphill um, from here. And I really appreciate the the questions and of course your um, your interest in how the university is doing and how we're succeeding or and or challenged. Um, on various fronts. I, I, I just want everybody to know that we are, you know, we're very, very grateful for the community support we have. And, um, you know, I, I've worked at a number of universities. I, I put the University of Lethbridge right at the top of that experience. What an amazing university community. Great students, great faculty, amazing staff. And uh, we're doing some really neat research there. So thank you so much for coming out to learn more about that.